Good morning. Today, I'd like to begin edging into a discussion that's going to represent the last of our change of point of views. So far, everything has been in a flat plane or in three-dimensional Euclidean geometry or the flat space-time of special relativity. I never have been really clear about the significance of this flat business, so I want to take a few moments to talk about that. Imagine that you have a couple of people. I'm going to call them Tom and Jim. They're standing outside in the midst of what appears to them to be a perfectly flat plain out in the middle of nowhere and they decide to do a geometry experiment. Jim is going to walk or travel a certain distance to the right. Tom is going to take a longer trip. Tom is going to travel due north for a while until he has traveled a distance equal to that that Jim traveled. Afterwards, though, Tom is going to turn to the right 90 degrees and travel that common distance again. The end result will be that Tom and Jim are separated by a large distance, the distance that Jim traveled. What if you actually did this, but what actually ended up happening was Jim travels his distance, Tom travels the first leg of his trip, and as Tom turns and begins the second leg, Jim sees Tom off in the distance, getting steadily closer to Jim until they meet up at this point. This is clearly impossible. It's impossible if that plane were actually flat. On the other hand, if these two people were actually on the surface of a very large sphere, and the distance that Jim travels is one quarter of the circumference, Tom moves off at what he believes to be a right angle to the direction that Jim's traveling until he goes one quarter of the circumference, then turns 90 degrees to the right, begins traveling towards Jim unknowingly, you would end up with a triangle that had three right angles in it, 270 degrees. This is impossible, of course, if you're in a flat Euclidean surface, but it isn't impossible if you're in a curved surface. This means our geometry is going to be messed with if we're not really in the kind of flat space or flat space time that we thought we were. It gets worse though. In a flat Euclidean plane or in three-dimensional Euclidean space or the flat space time of special relativity, we have very often used this thought that if I have a vector an arrow that starts at one point and ends at another, I can relocate that anywhere I like. The reason for that comes from the Euclidean parallel postulate. That says, if I give you a straight line, like the straight line this vector points along, and I give you a point that isn't on that straight line, then there is exactly one straight line that passes through the indicated point and is parallel to the first straight line. Drawing in an arrow in orange here that's the same length as this arrow, I can make a parallel copy of the vector that I started off with with the same length this is what lets me assume that the initial point of my vector is at the origin, and I can get the components of the vector by doing end minus start. What about Jim and Fred 
I can imagine giving Jim a ruler with an arrowhead glued to it, pointing due east, and I tell him, Jim, as you travel along your path, I want you to make sure that that vector, that arrow, never changes its direction. Since I'm in a curved surface, as I travel along my path, if I'm Jim, eventually the vector is pointing towards the back part of the sphere. What about the other fella? What about Tom? Tom starts off right next to Jim. Their vectors are the same. And as Tom goes north, he maintains, at least locally, the direction of the vector. Then, Tom is going to turn at 90 degrees to the right, but he's going to be very careful not to turn his vector when he does that. He's going to keep it the same as much as he can. Jim's vector ended up pointing that way. Tom's vector ends up pointing this way. The two vectors don't point in the same direction at the destination point. This is very bad. This means I can't rely on this sort of thing anymore. This means basically Everything I know about vectors just went out the windows. I can't parallel transport a vector around an arbitrary path and feel confident that I'm going to get something that doesn't depend on the path. Also, components of vectors in the flat situation end minus start. Difficult to say here. At first glance, this is very disturbing. I no longer know much of anything about anything. If you go back and look at the development of what we've done, regardless of special relativity or in flat spaces, we began looking at coordinate transformations. These lambda mu bar nus were secretly the partial derivatives of x mu bar with respect to x nu. We didn't write them that way because in the linear case they are constants. We thought about expressing a vector with respect to some coordinate system that led us to end minus start, which leads us to the vector component transformation law. We make what's called a coordinate basis. We look at the partial derivative of position with respect to one of the coordinates and call this one of our coordinate basis vectors. In a coordinate basis, or in any basis, I can write the vector as its components and the basis vectors. In the case, though, where I do have these kind of basis vectors, we figured out that this must be true. We introduced the notion of a one-form in terms of its components. Also, one-forms are linear functions of vectors into the scalars. Using that idea, we're able to figure this out. Much like with the vectors, we can express a one form in terms of its components and the coordinate basis one forms. These omega tilde alpha are special one forms. Given a coordinate system, construct the E alpha. Omega tilde alpha is the one form that gives you one back when you feed E alpha into it and zero if you feed any other basis vector element into it. Using the same kind of ideas that we'd used previously, we were then able to figure out how the coordinate basis one forms have to change when you change your coordinate system or frame of reference. We talked about the metric, which told us how to do dot products of the vectors,
We talked about how to raise or lower indexes using the metric. We talked about covariant derivatives, and we talked about geodesics. On the face of it, everything is right out the window. We don't know any of these things now. Logical content of our discussion so far then consists of these 16 key points. I want to think about how I would do something like this if I were not in a flat space. I'm going to imagine that my non-Euclidean space is a curved surface. I've drawn two copies of my curved surface so the picture will not become too complicated. In the blue picture, I'm going to look at point P, and I'm going to imagine that I've drawn in some coordinates for the surface. So on the blue surface, I'm going to draw in several lines of constant x1 value. x1 equals alpha is the x1 equal constant line, or curve, that my point P is on. And then I might have nearby places where x1 is constant. I need a second coordinate if I have a two-dimensional surface. So I'll call those numbers x2, and they'll have various values as well. Meanwhile, on the copy of the picture in orange, I can do the same. So I'll call the blue surface the unbarred coordinate system, and the orange one the barred one. First things first, I need to think about how I'm going to set up either vectors or one forms. Since these surfaces are curved, I am unable to do end minus start. I have to do something else. This in two levels. I'm going to define the components of a one form to be numbers p alpha that act the same way they acted in flat space. At this stage, it's not even clear that there is any such thing, but there are. The ordinary gradient of functions is like this. The second way I want to look at this is let u be a scalar function. If I figure the ordinary gradient of u, I get the components of a one form. The partial derivative of u with respect to alpha is component number alpha of some one form. Using the other coordinate system, component number mu bar is just the rate at which the scalar function changes on the surface as I change coordinate number mu bar only. How do these components relate to each other? If I define my one forms in this way, this is just the ordinary chain rule, and partial of u with respect to x alpha is p alpha, this automatically transforms the same way that a one form in flat space does. So I'm going to look at this from a different perspective now. I'll draw my coordinates on the surface, and I'm going to define the one forms first. Then after that, we'll define the vectors in terms of the one forms and see how much information we can get. So the motivation for doing this might have been obscure to start with. Look at it this way. It's a perfectly natural thing. So step one, I'm going to define one form components to be quantities that transform the same way that gradient components do. On my big list of stuff that worked in our first version of tensor calculus, I'm going to locate these facts and draw lines through them because they're still true even on curved surfaces and in curved spaces.
in my giant list of formulas, the way that one form components transfer was formula number 10. 10 is on my new list as well. Formula 10 works on curved surfaces. As we did with vectors, I can split up a one form in that way up into its first component times this one zero thing and plus p2 times this zero one thing. Here's where I have to be careful. The one zero and the zero one are not vectors. They're going to form a basis for the space of all one forms. At point P, I'm going to define omega tilde 1 to be the gradient of the first coordinate. It'll be the partial derivative of x1 with respect to x1 in the first component, and partial derivative of x1 with respect to x2 in the second one. In a likewise way, the components of omega tilde 2 will be the gradient of x2 at P, and that will be 0, 1 in components. It's very important to understand, though, that these are not arrows. These are one forms. If you haven't watched the video, Great Expectations, you ought to, because the right picture is, I'm going to go to my curved surface, and close to P, I'm going to draw in some parallel lines that are parallel to the curve where the first coordinate takes on a constant value. Likewise, to get omega tilde 2, I'll draw in a bunch of short parallel lines parallel to the place where x2 is a constant. At a given point, I could express a one form in terms of the unbarred coordinates or the barred coordinates. But I know something about the relationship between the components of the one form in the two coordinate systems. But in an exactly similar way to what we did back in the flat space case, I can rearrange this equation like this. And then this equation has to be true no matter which one form I'm looking at for P. So let P be the one form that in the barred system has components 1, 0, 0, 0. That says this formula with the mu set equal to 1 must be 0. Then look at the one with components 0, 1, 0, 0. 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 0, 1, the conclusion that you'll come to is that each number inside the parentheses separately must be 0. Starting with coordinates, thinking of one form components as acting the way partial derivatives of scalar functions do, we were led to the conclusion that omega tilde mu bar must be the partial derivative of x mu bar with respect to x alpha times omega tilde alpha. And so equation number 11 has been established and so has equation number 12. In our original version of all of this stuff, we introduced the one forms as linear functions of vectors that produce scalars as output. We let the one forms be the dual space to the collection of all the vectors. Because of the duality, I'm going to turn that right back around in our new thing. I'm going to define a vector to be a linear function that accepts a one form as input and delivers a scalar for output. Suppose that V is one of these new, very odd vectors, and I supply it with a one form, P. Select some basis, some coordinate basis, and write this as V 
evaluated at the sum p alpha omega tilde alpha. Because of the linearity, I can bring the p alphas out front, and in our previous work, we sometimes defined the component of a thing to be what you get when you put basis elements into that thing. So we'll follow that policy here. I'm going to take the function v and feed one of the basis one forms into it. I'll call the result v alpha. The duality still holds. We'll also define p tilde evaluated at v as the same thing. So we decided about one form components. One forms as linear functions of the vector in the old. In the new, vectors are linear functions of the one forms, but because of the duality, we more or less regard those as the same thing. Oh, one forms are linear functions of vectors. Vectors are linear functions of one forms. And I can calculate these one forms evaluated at vector or other way around using any coordinate system that's convenient for me. We already know something, though, about how the one form components transform. So I'll go on and write that in. Then we'll do the usual thing. This equation has to be true no matter which one form we picked to look at. So the quantity inside the parentheses must always be zero. Now, this is remarkable. I don't have a picture of vectors as arrows. I don't have a picture of end minus start for vectors. But even so, v nu bar is the partial derivative of x nu bar with respect to x alpha times v alpha. And equation number four is on the table now. Also, because of the way we described vector components, that's true. This isn't. This doesn't even make good sense now. By now, it probably doesn't even need to be said that you can use exactly the same idea to figure out how the coordinate basis vectors transform. And if you'll look, equation number seven is on the list now. This will never be true unless I choose to define the x vector to be the vector whose partial derivatives give me back the e alpha vectors. If I'm willing to adopt that as the definition of vector x, then that's on the table as well. End minus start doesn't work, can't work. The one forms were based on the coordinates. The coordinates transform a certain way. The one form components transfer the other way. So in a certain sense, these equations are not too important to me, although they are true in terms of connecting the coordinates in the unbarred versus barred system. The only thing that's left is to do something about the metric, the dot product of vectors, talk about raising and lowering indexes, how to do covariant derivatives, and from the covariant derivatives get our hands on the geodesics, and every single thing that we've talked about in the old setting is either still true in the new setting or not important to us. Coming up next, We've got to figure out what to do about these issues. Once we've done that, we will be able to do vector and tensor calculus in a curved space-time at a point, 
there will be complications, but we'll take a look at them when we get there. I hope everybody has a good day, and I'll talk to you again soon.